Oleg. So Oleg's going to be taking us into a slightly different direction, telling us about Metaflow. All right, we're starting to move into bringing machine learning onto Kubernetes. So Oleg, whenever you're ready, we can bring you on. Hey, what's up, man? How you doing? Hello. Hi, guys. Hey, guys. Good, good, good. Uh, we can see you perfectly. We can hear you perfectly. It's all yours, man. Take it away. Amazing. Okay, well, I'm glad to be here. But yeah, I'll talk a little bit about uh, our little project called Metaflow and how we brought it to uh, Kubernetes. But first, obviously, I may spend some a few minutes to talk about what Metaflow actually is before I jump into all the kind of juicy Kubernetes stuff. And uh, probably, hopefully, not going to take too much time to explain it. But it is a machine learning infrastructure framework. Uh, that is open source. It came out of, uh, was developed at Netflix originally a few years ago and then open sourced, I think in 2019. Yeah, probably coming up on two years now. And it was built to help data scientists and machine learning practitioners, uh, machine learning engineers at Netflix to uh, ship their models and whatever they develop to production. And the way we look at it at is there is a continuum of things that people do in those kind of roles. Uh, it's all kind of mixed up now. This is a growing um, area of machine learning AI stuff. Uh, but primarily, people who work on machine learning projects, they care the most about statistics, building new, uh, exciting deep learning networks, things like this, feature engineering, deploying their models to production. And maybe they care a little bit less uh, about other equally important stuff with infrastructure, but maybe they are not exactly in the job description, like data warehouses, how to provision compute resources, how to schedule those jobs, how to orchestrate them. And uh, even though they usually they're excited to learn more about all this stuff, they're not, if that starts to take 90% of their time, they're probably uh, maybe the infrastructure of the company not ready uh, to get to this next level of you know ML AI revolution. Uh, so the Metaflow is essentially a Python library that was built to make life easier for data scientists to uh, make it easier for them to package their code and ship it to production. And as you may know, uh, Netflix is a pretty advanced uh, company. I wasn't at Netflix. Uh, I'm currently, by the way, at a company called Outer Bounds that uh, was born to uh, bring Metaflow to kind of the outside world and make it work for more people, not just Netflix. So me and my co-founders, I wasn't at Netflix, but they were uh, working Metaflow for years. Uh, they built it to uh, cater to Netflix infrastructure. And as you probably know, Netflix is pretty AWS heavy and they have a lot of internal orchestration, container orchestration platforms that are not Kubernetes. Uh, but just kind of to ground this things, uh, this a little bit more, just a quick example of how Metaflow looks like in code. Uh, so it's a Python library. You describe uh, your machine learning workflow. Really, actually, it doesn't really care about machine learning that much. I mean, it's it's a fancy label these days, but it's really just a library to execute pieces of your Python code. And you break it down into steps, and those steps are automatically converted to containers that run somewhere. And at this point, maybe the data scientist doesn't care that much about infrastructure. They just care about their code being executed on time and the fact that they get some compute resources, GPUs, C CPUs, memory, that kind of stuff to run that code. And what we, we really like to think that Metaflow is very easy to learn for someone. They don't have to learn about containers. Well, I mean, they have to learn about containers, but not necessarily about, for example, Kubernetes or, or like 17 uh, containerization solutions that AWS offers. Uh, these days, so it all happens automatically. They just create a class and they create some methods there, and those methods magically get converted into uh, containers, and all the dependencies get packaged, and all artifacts that those uh, this code produces gets tracked, uh, and all this gets stored in uh, in a data store. Again, kind of abstracted away a little bit, but not too much from the data scientist. And another thing that we really like about Metaflow, and as you probably know, there's a bunch of kind of similar uh, projects that also claim to uh, make machine learning and data scientists uh, life easier. Uh, what we really care about uh, with Metaflow is user experience for those data scientists. It's very Pythonic, it's very natural. They don't have to learn a lot of new concepts and it's very easy for them to go from a prototype that runs on their laptop 
uh, and then maybe start running some parts of it in the cloud and maybe start running, storing data, not locally, but in some uh, object store. And then gradually they kind of, as they iterate, they can run more and more of their workflow remotely in AWS or in Kubernetes cluster. Uh, and then kind of graduate this thing and start running a production workflow without any of like any anything running on their laptop. Everything is completely now production grade and built with the best practices of their um, DevOps team. Uh, so the, for us, uh, we think of Metaflow as this Python layer. Uh, productivity layer on top of uh, whatever infrastructure you may have. And uh, like I said, so at Netflix, they have the system called Titus, which I think is open source, which is orchestration uh, solution similar to Kubernetes. Uh, for open source, for a long time, uh, Metaflow was pretty much only AWS, support only AWS native services, and specifically AWS Batch and uh, step functions if you know a little bit about that world uh, it's kind of a maybe yeah, aws equivalent of many things that you use day to day in uh, maybe other clouds or kubernetes and now the exciting thing for us is that uh, over the last three or four months we were uh, hard at work at bringing all that to kubernetes and making metaflow uh, kubernetes native so you don't have to uh, be locked into AWS so much, and you can, you can data scientists can use Kubernetes efficiently without necessarily learning all those concepts. Because as you probably know, there's still a good amount of things that you have to learn, just new, uh, new concepts that you have to learn to effectively use Kubernetes. And it's not always uh, the case that uh, data scientists have resources and actually bandwidth to do this. So we're trying to smoothen this out. So uh, for Kubernetes, what we're going to do is those small steps that I showed you just previously on this slide, they will be converted to Kubernetes jobs that will run Kubernetes. And uh, we will orchestrate everything with Argo. If you want to ship uh, your workflow to production, if you don't, you can just run parts of your code in Kubernetes easily uh, by using those nifty Python decorators and then kind of be done with this. And again, this should hopefully will become our main recommended solution for people running those data intensive workloads uh, is to just use Kubernetes and kind of stop caring about anything else. And that kind of brings them uh, capabilities, all the, all, the, all the benefits that you will know uh, that when it comes to configuration management and uh, multi-cloud story and security. And I think in this talk, what I wanted to talk about is a little bit about uh, our journey, how we actually build this, because I did use a Kubernetes for a few years now, but uh, I cannot call myself a kind of a huge um, frontier man. I don't know if that's a word, but uh, kind of I, I'm still I feel I still feel like I'm new to the whole ecosystem, and there are a few challenges and a few things that we learned about Kubernetes. Some of them were actually very positive surprises for us. And maybe I can offer some perspective on how Kubernetes can be even more friendly to this whole kind of machine learning data science industry. And where I think, especially when it comes to data and data intensive workloads, where it has something unique to offer compared to the more like, well, I guess it's different sense, like vendor cloud native uh, offerings. Uh, so First thing is maybe a little bit of a challenge that we encountered, and it's, I wouldn't say it's unique to Kubernetes really, but um, so as you well know, the biggest advantage really of Kubernetes is that it's completely declarative approach to infrastructure. You just describe things in this uh, YAML, I guess the main specific language, and things just happen. So you say, I need to have a service, I have to have an ingress, secrets, whatever running in my cluster, I do keep still apply and it just happens. So that my infrastructure kind of smoothly um, moves into the state uh, that I just described and I don't really care how it got there. So the challenge with machine learning orchestration and like orchestrating data pipelines 
is really the final state doesn't matter that much. Like the final state is always nothing is running. Like if I schedule my machine learning training job, I really know like the end state is not that interesting. The, the, the most interesting part is how we get there because my job needs to run. It can fail for a thousand reasons. As I iterate, it may start requiring more memory. It requires a GPU, it times out, something happens. And all those intermediate states is the most interesting thing if you think about it from the data scientist perspective or from uh, the perspective of someone who has to debug and iterate on those uh, workflows. And again, partially, this is kind of the flip side of the benefits that Kubernetes has with all this declarative infrastructure. Uh, is that a lot of things? A lot of things happen through operators and controllers, and they all happen asynchronously. So there is really uh, a lot of time that there is this intermediate states, and with controllers, those uh, the controlled objects like the of the uh, Kubernetes object that controller creates, they may not always match the state of the kind of parent uh, object or custom resource. And uh, that was a little bit of a surprise for us. Not a surprise for us, but something we had to spend a lot of time on reconciling those states and making sure they're exposed. And I think it's actually coming back to the kind of the topic of the day to data on Kubernetes. This is also true for uh, stateful worker loads, because again, uh, at, at its core, Kubernetes is very declarative. When you talk about making a backup, this is not a Exactly. This is like, this is the opposite of declarative. This is like an imperative action that you have to take and you want Kubernetes to take, and then uh, it leads to a little bit of friction uh, in terms of creating the best possible human interface to this. Um, so that was that was a little bit of a challenge. Uh, on the positive side, when it comes to uh, data intensive things, actually the everyone was telling a story that. Kubernetes and anything that has to, to deal with data on Kubernetes is really scary. It's not that bad as I expected it to be, honestly. It's matured a lot since I uh, kind of looked at it the first time. There's a lot of tooling, as you know. Uh, there is a lot of uh, both with uh, Ceph and Minio. If you want to run object stores on Kubernetes, it's relatively smooth and boring experience. I should say, again, like coming from this AWS uh, vendor specific uh, land of where you kind of pay a lot of money for those things and they still don't work. A lot of the stuff is actually smoother on Kubernetes, surprisingly, even more than some of the commercial offerings that I have. This, I have the screenshots here of the AWS tab functions just for fun and patch. Uh, they are super clunky and I think uh, Kind of Kubernetes definitely Kubernetes story these days is actually is definitely a lot easier uh, to get started with and just tooling that you can provide for people to debug all the issues they they, they run into uh, when running those workloads. Um, and when it comes to storage, actually, where's my clicker here? Um, so Metaflow has there's a lot of time invested in Metaflow in making kind of creating utility libraries and making sure everything, when people, when data scientists write those workloads, obviously they work with a lot of data. Usually it's stored in some object storage and the Metaflow team back at Netflix spend a lot of time uh, making sure the performance is optimal because it's, uh, it's it sounds easy to just kind of download files from the object store, you know, you really get object, whatever. Actually, there's a lot of things that can go wrong. Uh, it's easy to download things. It's hard to make this object store perform great, even if uh, the actual object store is owned for, let's say, AWS. If you talk about S3, writing a decently performant client for S for S3 for downloading files at full bandwidth, like 10 gigabits or more per second, is not trivial. So we spend a lot of time on this. And as we migrated to uh, started to migrate Metaflow to Kubernetes started looking into uh, Kubernetes native data storage solutions, uh, you all know. And uh, there have been the good surprises is like, since we support S3 API, we're pretty much out of the box compatible with Minio and uh, Ceph. Uh, and that works. Uh, there's still a lot of work ahead of us to make sure the performance is uh, on par with 
uh, vendor specific solutions, but very optimistic here actually, because I, I used Minio maybe years ago, but it wasn't as easy as, as it is today. De definitely, uh, they've ma made huge progress on making this accessible. It's still not 100% clear which way someone should go. So I was actually hoping uh, maybe for me, the takeaway from this is maybe someone will, I'll, I'll get a better idea what, uh, what offering what open source offering on Kubernetes is actually the most stable and something that we can recommend to our customers. And one big thing, uh, at least maybe one take, small takeaway from this talk is that I think there's a unique opportunity for this community and for everyone who cares about Kubernetes and specifically running data, data intensive workloads on Kubernetes uh, compared to vendor offerings. Uh, Kubernetes can actually, as complex as it is in some regards, this is an opportunity to simplify authentication and access story a lot for those people. Because one example is recently, like two weeks ago, we actually had a joint blog post with Selden, who is obviously very Kubernetes native company, if you know them. They uh, develop an open source solution for model deployment in Kubernetes. And we take a stab at it. We uh, Try to imagine how work, a full end-to-end -end workflow for a data scientist would look like if they were using Metaflow for orchestrating bad jobs, so like uh, getting the data extracted from whatever, uh, then writing their machine learning models, train them, then deploy the um, black, uh, then deploy them to production as microservices using Selden, and pretty much ninety percent of this just works. Uh, works great. It's relatively intuitive. Uh, but the biggest caveat was always with authentication and I'm sorry, uh, authorization because, and we were doing this with the uh, AWS native version of Metaflow, not the new Kubernetes version. And just getting all those credentials piped through between uh, Metaflow tasks, uh, getting access to S3, some microservices getting access to S3, Metaflow uh, steps, being able to deploy things on Kubernetes as services, all this, Piping uh, still leaves a lot to be desired, and that's that was mostly because we were using AWS, trying to combine AWS native storage like S3 was Selden, which is fully Kubernetes native. So imagine if actually there was a solution like Meteor or Ceph, maybe relying on service uh, accounts for auth, and maybe streamlining the story a little bit, and probably that would be ideal because this is really the biggest obstacle that we see that people run into. Uh, when they try to deploy Metaflow with similar uh, ML ops platforms is just, there is just so many moving parts that have to talk to each other and they all have to authenticate. And there is, it's just really hard to get this done on any public cloud as even though they put a lot of effort in making this smoother. And I think Kubernetes with this unified API for everything basically and operators and pretty much infinite extensibility uh, may be the answer here, or at least I'm very optimistic that it is. And uh, that's pretty much it. I mean, didn't have a lot of time, but uh, talk to us on Slack, or you can you know shoot me an email or on Twitter. I'll be on the uh, doc Slack for a while if you have any questions. But that's it.